On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have Mr. Brian Chi and Mr. Curtis Franklin here today. Now, attackers, they want to steal your data and deploy ransomware, but they have to go through a series of steps to actually get to that point. Now, abusing identity attack paths in Active Directory is a popular method. Now, we'll get into how you can actually secure some things, maybe some tips on how you can make things better. Now, network continues to be evolving for organizations. What better way to understand the trends than hear from market leaders like Cisco Meraki? That's right. Today, we have Raj Krishna. He's VP of Strategy and Planning at Cisco Meraki. And we're going to talk about a lot of interesting topics, including SD-WAN and some sassy solutions. You shouldn't miss it. Twiat on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 465, recorded October 15th, 2021. Twyatt gets sassy. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Melissa. The U.S. Postal Service processes more than 98,000 address changes daily. Is your customer contact data up to date? Try Melissa's APIs in the developer portal. It's easy to log on, sign up, and start playing in the API sandbox 24 7. Get started today with 1,000 records clean for free at melissa.com slash twit. And by CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike harnesses the power of every click, every action, and every ally to grow stronger and stop cyber threats before they can stop you. Join the fight and experience the power of Falcon Platform for free today at crowdstrike.com slash twit. And by Nareva. Nareva is revolutionizing audio for meeting and learning spaces by making it possible to get full room microphone coverage in medium to large spaces without the cost and complexity of multi-component AV solutions. That's a revolution. Learn more at nareva.com slash twit. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world's connected. I'm your host, Louis Maresca, your guide through this big world of the enterprise. But I can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals, the experts in their field, starting with our very own network and security expert and all around tech geek, Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, how are you, my friend? What's keeping you busy? I'm good. I'm actually kind of glad that I had a delay in my house remodeling. The roofers were going to be starting this morning and now it's postponed to Monday. So hopefully I'll have a new roof by the time the next Twilight episode rolls around. So hopefully we don't get any rain games. episodes during that because that's a, that's a metal roof, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a metal roof. <laughs> so it should be fun. Be fun. You be know? Indeed, it will be. Well, now you got it. You just got a, a a new gadget in the mill. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I um I just got some uh, Teradex slices. They're um, nineteen inch amp amp rack broadcasting engines. Uh, so I can take Ooh. in a um, HDMI feed and then rebroadcast to you know various streaming things, Wowza, uh, Facebook, YouTube and so forth, wow. or just straight RTMP. Uh, but I can do it at um, 1080p, 60 frames per second, which is kind of nice. Very so, nice. Very nice. They're, they're fun, toys, they're fun the toys. toys. They're just, you know, yeah. I'm getting ready to broadcast um, the uh, Maker Faire, you know, especially oh, cool. ro the robot battles. Um, that, that, ought to be fun. And I've got an ATEM mini that I'm going to use so we can do a multi-camera setup and uh, broadcast the robot battles. Robot ruckus. Very cool. Very cool. You guys get to go all the fun stuff, all the fun stuff. Well, speaking about going all the fun stuff, we also have our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. He's a senior analyst and I'm Dia. Curtis, what's keeping you busy this past week and uh, what kind of fun stuff are you heading to? Well, I've got, got some interesting things coming up. I'm going to be... Uh, peeking into the virtual Splunk conference next week, Conf 21. Uh, and I have uh, been involved with and I'm starting to, to ramp up for a couple of things 
On November 17th, I'm going to be delivering a webinar on gamification in awareness training. That should be fun. I'm also speaking on some of the uh, bigger threats out there and some of the threat vectors and methodologies on uh, or at a virtual event being presented by Dark Reading. I'll have the URLs for both of those in my Twitter feed. Uh, would love to have lots of folks from the Twilight Riot show up to heckle and add to the general intellectual level of the discourse. Fantastic. Looking forward to all of that. Well, speaking about looking forward to, we do have a quite the week in technology and enterprise news, so we should definitely get started with all of the amazing news. Thanks, you guys, for being here. Now, attackers that want to steal data, you know, they deploy ransomware and they but they have to go through a series of steps to do it, right? They have to get into your network somehow. And sometimes abusing identity attack paths, like maybe something in Active Directory, is a popular method there. Well, we'll get into some of those specifics and maybe how you can secure those things and make it easy, less easy for them to do so. Now, networking continues to evolve for organizations, but what better way to understand the trends is to hear from a market leader. That's right. Today, we have Raj Krishna. He's VP of Strategy and Planning at Cisco Meraki. And we're going to talk about a lot of interesting topics here, including SD1, ML and AI networking, and a lot more. So definitely stick to the show because we'll get into that very soon. But first, before we get into all those exciting topics, we have to take you through this week's exciting news blips. Now, we talk about ransomware a lot on this podcast because there's a growing trend of organizations becoming victim of it. However, there's a constant question. What needs to happen to stop attacks getting worse? Well, we all know the pattern. Victims often realize that they've been compromised when files, servers, and other systems have been encrypted, and they're presented with a ransom note demanding a payment in cryptocurrency for the decryption key. Now, there's a kicker to this whole ordeal. Even if cyber criminals are already inside your network, it's not necessarily too late to prevent a ransomware attack. That's right. If an organization has a good good threat hunting strategy, they can detect strange or suspicious activity and counter the threat before ransomware becomes a major problem. Now, that's because criminals can spend weeks in the network before triggering a ransomware attack. And, and even if protections designed to prevent them from entering the network have failed, this delay can provide an opportunity for preventing a full-blown ransomware attack. Now, the U.S. Department of Commerce's National Institute of Standards and Technology Cybersecurity Framework lists actually five functions of securing your network, and that's identity, protection, detect, respond, and recover. But many organizations are still attempting to rely on the protect aspect of the main line of defense without a clear strategy. And if they have one at all, on how to detect and respond to threats that bypass protections. Now, if organizations have a good knowledge of their own network and a threat hunting team that can take knowledge of how these hands-on ransomware attacks work and use it to detect threats, they can be identified, removed, and remediated before the problem grows to become a full-scale ransomware attack. Smaller businesses or those without a significant IT or information security budget could actually struggle here to engage in threat hunting themselves, but it can be useful for helping to prevent a ransomware attack and much less costly than falling victim to one. What does this mean for your organization? Well, it means that it might be time to start thinking about spending some dollars on a team that could be threat hunting. In the meantime, there are actually a ton of services out there that could be used as gap fillers that are using the latest in machine learning and AI to help detect and remediate threats as activity is detected on your network. Now, the key to all this is to starting down the path and spending the dollars. Now, you just have to convince your C-suite to do it. Well, let's go from the general topic of ransomware to one that's very specific. There's some new ransomware out there. It's called Black Byte, and it's just been picked apart and analyzed. During a recent malware incident response case, researchers at Trustwave encountered an interesting piece of ransomware that goes by the name of Black Byte. They've analyzed the ransomware and written a decryptor for it, and they're sharing their analysis in a pair of blog posts. Now, they say that Black Byte has several interesting features. Just like any other notorious ransomware variants like Revel, Black Byte avoids systems with Russian and ex-USSR or Eastern European languages, has a worm functionality similar to Riot ransomware. It creates a wake on land magic packet and sends it to the target host so it makes sure that they're alive when it's infecting them. 
the author hosted the encryption key in a remote HTTP server and in a hidden file with a .png extension. In addition, the author lets the program crash if it fails to download the encryption key. The RSA public key embedded in the body is only used once to encrypt the raw key to display in the ransom note. And that's it. And finally, the ransomware uses only one symmetric key to encrypt the files. That's where the decryptor comes in. In addition, the auction site that is linked in the ransom note has its own quirks. Primarily, the site claims that it has exfiltrated data from its victims, but the ransomware itself doesn't have any exfiltration functionality. So researchers feel that the claim is probably designed to scare their victims into complying. Now, if you have any interest at all in how ransomware works down at the software and system level, I'm going to highly recommend that you spend a few minutes on the Trustwave blog site. And props to the researchers over there for a great look into this new bit of software. Well, my story is a little light. Um, this is this is you know a kind of a knee jerk reaction to the pandemic, but the Acer Corporation's antimicrobial laptops have actually been around for a few years. But the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly ramped up interest. During the next at Acer event the other day, the company announced three new PCs, a laptop, a two-in-one, and a tablet that will be joining its antimicrobial lineup. So what does antimicrobial mean anyway? Something is considered antimicrobial if it's capable of, quote, destroying or inhibiting, or inhibiting the growth of microorganisms and especially pathogenic microorganisms. That means it fights disease causing things that you can't see. Well, Acer claims its antimicrobial 360 design as it brands the feature fights germs in two ways. First, high touch areas such as the chassis exterior and hinge, the keyboard, the touchpad and the fingerprint reader are coated with a silver ion agent. Now, for years, research has pointed to silver ions ability to fight bacteria. As a more recent report published in the ACS Applied Biomaterials um journal they explain they can readily absorb to most biomolecular biomolecules sorry which are dna membrane protein enzymes or intracellular cofactors um, in the bacteria to inactivate their functions now the acers silver ion agent is compliant with regulations from the epa and the biocidal products regulation it can cut bacteria count to 1000 after a 99 percent reduction based on the iso standard 22196 test protocol the 22196 standard specifies methods for testing the quote antibacterial activity of antibacterial treated plastics and other non-porous surfaces of products, unquote. Well, on a similar theme, I'd like to go to this. <clears throat> uh, some of you that have kids, especially young children, they are Petri dishes and they touch everything. And so a lot of schools, especially um, kiddies, you know, kiddie schools, you know, preschools and so forth, are starting to adopt antimicrobial paints. So this one happens to be from PPG. There's several um, other brands available. Just look for antimicrobial paints and you should be able to find a whole bunch of them. But the idea is to repaint high touch areas in schools, you know, like bathroom doors, um, desktop, you know, school desks, uh, all that kind of good stuff to try and reduce the amount of spread that children have a bad habit of sharing amongst each other's. So I have a lot of friends that are teachers and the politicians are pushing them to go back to doing in-person classes. But yet there's, you know, one of my friends said, well, within a week after school started, um, almost 60% of her class were symptomatic. So she's a little, she's more than a little nervous. So I got a sneaky hunch. I'm probably going to buy a couple of gallons and have it delivered to her. Thanks, Cheever. Now we talk a lot about new programs, campaigns, policies flowing through government agencies in order to enhance our cyber defense programs. What you don't hear about 
as if they're actually moving towards making things better. Well, we may have been a given a signal on how things are actually going on inside. Now, a senior cybersecurity official at the Pentagon said that he quit because he thought it was impossible for the U.S. to compete with China on AI. Now, look, look Nicholas Shalin joined the U.S. Air Force as his first chief software officer in August 2018. Now, he worked to equip it and the Pentagon with the most secure and advanced software available. But he quit on September 2nd. In his departing LinkedIn post, he cited the Pentagon's reluctance to make cybersecurity and AI a priority as a reason for his resignation. In fact, this is actually pretty interesting. Lots of mixed signals going on here. Now, a quote from him actually is this, quote, we have no competing fighting chance against China in 15 to 20 years. Right now, it's already a done deal. It's already over, in my opinion. He also went on to say the AI capabilities of cyber and cyber defense of some government departments were at, quote, kindergarten level. Now, something else also interesting here was that he said the U.S. national security was being compromised by Google's refusal to work with the Pentagon on AI. Now, all this and after all this is actually after we heard about how China is actually aiming to become the leading AI superpower by 2030. Now, you might be wondering, what is the reason that he actually left this job? Well, according to him, quote, I am just tired of continuously chasing support and money to do my job. My office still has no billet and no funding this year and next. Pretty interesting. Now, hopefully we can dig into this more once it starts to evolve over time. I don't want to see this type of proclamation die over time because no one was interested in digging into it, which I'm sure the Pentagon is hoping we do. But what this does show is that there are different levels of focus when it comes to the government, the political advertising of it, and the actual implementation of it. Let's hope they merge one of these days. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we get to the bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech. And that's Melissa. Now, having accurate customer data, address data is crucial for the success of your business. Now, did you know that nearly 36 million address changes were processed by the USPS in 2020? It's a lot. In fact, one of them was mine. Now, that's a huge chunk of customers you could be missing out on. Now, 30% of customer data goes bad each and every year. But Melissa can help you make sure your data is current and accurate. Now, Melissa's tools have helped businesses maintain fresh data for over 35 years, which explains why over 10,000 businesses trust the address experts. And Melissa has a renewal rate of over 92%, which is proof that the companies love Melissa and you will too. Now, you can verify addresses, emails, phone numbers, and names in real time with Melissa. In fact, Melissa's global address verification service verifies addresses from 240 countries and territories at the point of entry. Now, tired of having duplicate customer information in your database? Well, with Melissa's data matching, you can eliminate clutter and duplicates, increase accuracy of the database, and reduce postage and mailing costs. Now, get the information that completes your customer profiles better. Add consumer demographic info to your records, such as marital status or social media handles. Now, Melissa's flexible deployment options offer different platforms to suit any preference, business size, or budget. Now, with flexible on-premise, web service, secure FTP processing, and software as a service delivery options, Melissa also has their new Lookups app on iOS and Google to search addresses, names, and more at your fingertips. Now, Melissa continually undergoes independent security audits to reinforce their commitment to data security, privacy, and compliance requirements. In fact, they're SOC 2, HIPAA, and GDPR compliant. Now, Melissa's Global Support Center also offers 24-7 world-renowned support if you sign up for a service level agreement. Now, you can inquire today. Now, Melissa is still supporting communities and qualifying essential workers during COVID-19. See if your organization qualifies for six months of free service by applying online at melissa.com. G2 Crowd's Fall 2021 report ranked Melissa as a leader in both address verification and data quality software, so you know they are meeting the diverse needs of all of your customers. Congratulations to Melissa. Make sure your customer contact data is up to date. Try Melissa's APIs in the developer portal. It's easy to log on, sign up, and start playing in the API sandbox 20 Four, seven. Get started today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. That's melissa.com slash twit. And we thank Melissa for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. 
Well, folks, it's now time for the bytes. Now, attackers need to enter a network somewhere, right? And they need to somehow exploit the system and services in order to, to lay in wait before they actually do their dirty deed. The question is, what do they actually exploit first? Curtis is going to take us through it. Curtis? Thanks, Lou. Now, pretty much everyone watching or listening to Twyat knows that you can't have an enterprise network without some sort of directory for that network. And the leading network directory these days is Microsoft's Active Directory, or AD. Now, attackers who get into a network must be able to exploit weak spots in AD, either its design or primarily its implementation, if they're going to do lateral spreading through the network. So attackers wanting to steal data, deploy ransomware, conduct espionage, have to go through a series of steps beginning with initial access all the way through establishing persistence and lateral movement. Ultimately, they have to exploit, as I said, AD. Now, securing Active Directory is non-trivial, largely because AD environments can be enormous because, you know, they involve every user, every server, in many cases, every device on the network, as well as in modern architectures, cloud instances as well. Now, if you have ever done any work as a penetration tester or a member of a red team, you know that one of the key ways that defenders can protect against nefarious action is by mapping and prioritizing what are called choke points. Now, choke points are places that are so commonly known as places where weaknesses lie that virtually all attack paths have to go through them. So if you can close off one of these choke points in general, you can limit the effectiveness of any attack. Think of it as one element in a successful zero trust implementation because the aim through all of this is to not so much prevent an attacker from getting into the network, but make sure that if they get into the network, they can't go any place important and damage or steal anything of value. Attackers like these attack paths because they're easy to use and hard to detect. Now, often they're created by poor implementation or user behavior. Now, think of domain admins interactively logging into workstations or misconfiguring Active Directory, uh, you know, something like giving a domain user group full control of the top of the domain. In other words, the part of the domain that has visibility into and control over the entire rest of the network. Unlike ransomware that tends to come in and do something entirely unusual, like, oh, trying to de uh, encrypt an entire volume on a hard disk, exploiting these AD attack paths frequently looks like normal admin or user behavior. And since pretty much every Active Directory has common features in its deployment and setup, a successful attacker can use a working approach over and over and over again. So there are always going to be choke points. And to figure them out, the first thing a red team or a defender must do is figure out what those choke points are. Identify the attack paths and the misconfigurations that could have the greatest impact on the organization's overall security posture. You have to identify high priority targets, identify ways to get to them, 
and make sure that those targets include things like tier zero assets, you know, the domain controllers, the high value systems that are unique to your enterprise, but incredibly powerful within your enterprise. It also requires mapping the AD environment to, dis to figure out what the paths are to all of those high value targets. Now, there are always going to be choke points. Now, this is true of whether you're talking about physical infrastructure or network infrastructure. If you want an analogy for physical infrastructure, think of the city of Manhattan, the tunnels and bridges that get onto and off of the island. There are a finite number of those, and the vast majority of traffic goes over one of those or through one of those. Those are choke points. Think of the doors into buildings. They're choke points. Now look for those analogies within an Active Directory implementation, and you'll start to identify your choke points. There are some open source tools, uh, things like Bloodhound, Pingcastle, that can help find these choke points. There are other uh, pieces of software uh, that can help you find root causes of things. And in order to do that, they tend to have to help map AD and look for these choke points. Now, I want to bring in my co-host because especially Brian is going to have lots and lots of experience in deploying these networks and knowing what the choke points are. And Chibert, we know that especially in small and medium-sized organizations, too many times the administrators are, well, they're IT generalists who have had to pick up AD domain control and they've had to learn on the fly. Um, so what's the best practice for them? I mean, if you're someone who's in a 100-person organization, you came in as someone who could set up Windows workstations, and all of a sudden you've just been told you're the new network admin, where do you learn and what do you do to make sure that you don't have an open-door policy to every attacker out there? Uh, my biggest piece of advice for anyone that gets thrown into the deep end with any directory authentication system, not just Active Directory, but also LDAP, <clears throat> is make sure you allocate enough time. So here's, here's the issue. <clears throat> Best practices means uh, you give the you give the user template because you're always creating a user template of some sort. Either that template's then applied as a group or to multiple users and you, you copy or something like that. Now, uh, almost in every single project, even with allocating way more time than I needed, it's always been a rush. And mostly the reason for those rushes has been really bad or missing documentation um, on the apps that we're trying to install. You know, even the ones that um, corporations that will send us virtual machines where we just drop them in and they're running, <clears throat> they're not doing a very good job of explaining the security model. Um, they say, oh, you need to have this or that, you know, and so forth, but they don't actually spell out what kinds of rights you need in order to make things work, or if they make an attempt, they haven't tested it, or they have a lot, a lack of documentation. That has been my biggest frustration. So when I was working on doing classified installations, this was a huge, huge deal. And what we ended up doing is almost 90% of the install was around the security models. How do we make sure we give the people that are using the app or whatever, the least amount of rights possible to be able to do their job, um, but yet not go more. 
And the problem is some of these um, applications, especially the ones that are, shall we say, um, built by teeny tiny little companies, they just oh, just, you know, you just need this, this, and this, and it amounts to pretty much just shy of a full admin. So here's my suggestion. This is partly to the end users, partly to the um, people that write the software or write the systems. One, give yourself a lot of time so you can go and have enough time to create those template users and test the heck out of them. Authors of software systems and so forth, you need to create a best practice template. Write down to build checklists. Come on, you know you know how much how many rights you need. You've gone through the development process. Why can't you create a checklist and then go and create an additional document on how to test for those rights? I think that's one of the biggest things missing from large scale systems. Now, I'm going to toot a little horn for Microsoft. Microsoft has a whole series of documents. They're called reviewers guides. They are spectacular. They'll go in and they'll, it's basically designed for um, the press so that they can go in, even if they aren't experts, they have enough background material to know why they're making the changes. My personal suggestion is, you people out in the world that are writing systems, go look at a lot of these reviewer guides that Microsoft puts out. Use those as templates. My big thing is if you're going to be designing something new, steal from the best. And right now, the reviewer's guides from Microsoft and Salesforce and Google are spectacular. Use them, abuse them. Don't copy directly because that's copyright infringement, but they're great ideas and go through and... If you want to go and make your systems more secure, make it easier for the people that got thrown in the deep end. Don't assume that they're absolute experts on everything there is to be about Active Directory. Some really good advice there, Chebert. And I, Lou, I want to come over to you because one of the things that, that Brian sort of touched on, we know that it's fairly common practice, both in large enterprises and in smaller enterprises that are ordering from a distributor to get a server that has been pretty well pre-configured before it ever hits their floor. And one of my questions is, when you look at these pre-configured servers, how likely is it that they've created one or more accounts for the purpose of completing the setup that have more privileges than they need. Um, and, you know, is this a really secure way of doing things? Or is this a case where there is a, such a level of complexity in AD that there's really no way around it? Yeah, these are good questions. I think going to the first one around like the con default con configurations coming from manufacturers, that is a real thing. Like I have seen this before. In fact, I was at an organization once when they were installing new machines. Um, you know, they these machines had like a high number of guest accounts or guest users added to it. Um, and then these particular guest users had um, you know, insecure six settings too, as well. Like they were had higher privileges that they were supposed to have. Um, they had unrestricted access to the administration portal, stuff like that. And I think these, again, for, for, for configuration purposes, but they were supposed to be revoked eventually once things were set up and, and, uh, and moving to production. And I think a lot of organizations don't look to this. And I think it stems historically from the fact that AD used to be part of IT rather than security. And so I think IT people, you know, they just expect this to work, but it's really requires a lot of the special attention in order to secure it. And sometimes it's just overlooked. Like, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, best practices on the list of to do's when it comes to AD. Like for instance, you can't just patch systems. You can't just limit privileges or, or, or just maintain AD hygiene. Uh, you have to, you have to do a lot more. And I think that's where, you know, you were talking about finding the choke points. You, know, you have to, you have to conduct, um, you know, 
different systemic assessments along the way. You have to Im implement live detection capabilities. You have to you have to do things like run tools. Like you know, I've seen examples of tools like Ativo Network's AD Assessor. He can, it can run continuously or even on demand. It can can identify those misconfigurations that you have on there. Those common things that you do wrong. Um, like for like excessive privileges or data exposure of, uh, of policies and so on and so forth. So I, I really like the idea that you called out choke points because that's a really important thing. But I also think that organizations need to reduce the blast radius as well. And that means that they need real time detection of like whether privilege, privilege ex escalations or or they need early warning systems that could limit um, attackers reach. And I think that that's that's where organizations need to pay attention to. So I think they need kind of defense on both sides. And like I said, I think just traditionally, it's because it wasn't part of the main rules. You know, that's very true. We're seeing a lot of roles switch around and move. I just wrote a piece for Omnia that talks about the fact that just because something doesn't involve a direct attack, doesn't mean it's not something that security should be involved in. There's this famous triad, the CIA triad, for confidentiality, data integrity, and access. And if something touches any of those three factors, then it's uh, something that security should care about. You know, one option might be a playbook, and many companies have these. We talk about playbooks all the time in incident response and cybersecurity, but there's no reason for there not to be a playbook when it comes to deploying new servers and new features, new functions, anything. Have these, think of them as like a pre-flight checklist for an airplane. You know, the pilot's who push back a, a 757 or a 767 probably have thousands of hours in the seat, but they still have the checklist that they go through to make sure they don't forget anything. IT, with the assistance of cybersecurity, should be doing something similar. If not, you're never going to figure out what these checkpoints are, identify them, and make sure that they are dangerous, rocky shoals for attackers trying to get into your network. Well, that's going to do it for our bites upcoming. Well, we've got a guest. Before we get to that guest, though, I'm going to turn it back over to Lou to talk about a sponsor. Thank you, Curtis. That's right. And that's CrowdStrike. Now, you've seen the headlines that we talk about all the time here on Twitter ransomware attack after ransomware attack holding businesses hostage. It can feel like it's only a matter of time before it comes to you and you'll have to decide, do you pay or do you lose everything? But there's a third option. That's right. What if you could defeat your adversaries before the fight even starts? Now with CrowdStrike, you're not alone in the battle against ransomware. They have a they have this great line. It's a secure, a secure future demands a shared defense. And there's a reason because CrowdStrike's Falcon platform uses their threat graph powered by advanced AI to analyze behavior on your devices, servers, and cloud workloads to find the threats and stop them in their tracks. Now, we talked to CTO Michael Sintonis and asked him, can you explain more about how CrowdStrike's threat graph helps to actually find threats? All the data points, the signals that we get come from the endpoints and the workloads that we have uh, around the world. So we have uh, an incredibly um, distributed network of customers from all around the world. And ThreatGraph enables our platform to correlate those approximately 7 trillion endpoint related events per week in real time. Next, CrowdStrike is at another level when it comes to their security platform. It delivers the industry most powerful set of tools of like today's most sophisticated cyber attacks all delivered via the cloud through a lightweight intelligent agent now in a recent forester study they found falcon complete really delivers in fact it has a 403 percent return on investment with a hundred percent confidence now crowdstrike harnesses the power of every click every action and every ally to grow stronger and stop cyber threats before they can stop you know, Falcon Complete stops breaches every hour of every day through expert management, threat hunting, monitoring and remediation, and it's backed by CrowdStrike's breach prevention warranty. Now, they don't just say it. They guarantee it for Falcon Complete managed customers who receive a warranty covering up to $1 million in the event of an actual breach. Terms and conditions apply. Gartner Magic Quadrant named CrowdStrike a leader for endpoint protection platform for 20 
21. Join the fight and experience the power of Falcon Platform for free today at CrowdStrike.com slash twit. That's CrowdStrike.com slash twit. CrowdStrike because what we've built together is worth defending together. And we thank CrowdStrike for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. And today we have Raj Krishna. He's VP of Strategy and Planning at Cisco Meraki. Welcome to the show, Raj. Lou, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Now, we love having Cisco because as a market leader in networking, we get to hear about all the trends and the future avenues for organizations. But I want to start very general. I want to start very general. Before we get to that, our audience do loves to to hear people's journeys and origin stories. Can you maybe take us through a short journey through tech and what brought you to Cisco Meraki? Yeah, Lou, I'd love to. So I started in tech a long time ago. In high school, I graduated uh, early. I was 17 when I graduated. So I took a year off, built my first startup. That startup we built on top of Asterix, which is an open source PBX software, essentially a call switching module that allowed people to call each other anonymously. That company was acquired when it was just about four or five people, went off to college, started my second company out of college. That company was building cellular routers. Now that company was not successful. So I decided, hey, let me try to get some experience, not in a huge company, but in a small, fast growing startup. And that's what led me to Meraki because of my experience in cellular, wireless, um, and in cloud technologies, because in my startup, we were proxying all of our traffic from that router through an Amazon EC2 instance. This is back in 2009, 2010. So we were very early. Because of that experience, that was a great fit for Meraki. So Meraki hired me as a product manager and uh, was acquired about a couple of years later. And I basically grown with Meraki as a part of the Cisco family, ended up taking on all of product management for Meraki at Cisco. Now I run strategy for the Meraki division as a part of Cisco. Fantastic. Quite the journey. Now, you know, we have a lot to talk about and and I know that, you know, there's lots of stuff that's coming up from Cisco Meraki, but in general, I th- we've seen a lot of trends, I think over the last three years, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of organizations moving off of the traditional MPLS type connections um, and more to our software defined type things. Can you maybe just take us through how you've seen things evolve over the last, like, let's say three years or so? Definitely. So the first big trend that we're seeing in the networking space is this evolution and movement towards cloud architectures. More and more what's happening is the virtualization of traditional hardware appliances, of traditional software applications that required a customer to to purchase and deploy a hardware appliance in their data center. More and more of those capabilities are moving to the cloud. In fact, this is Meraki's bread and butter. That traditional management appliance for managing your wireless networks, for managing your security architectures, we virtualized all of that. And we've created a beautiful, elegant cloud managed interface to be able to manage all, all, all of your network. So that's the first trend I think is the, the, the movement towards building architectures in the cloud and moving a lot of the hardware complexity into the cloud, abstracting that away for the customer. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is this huge emphasis and focus on security and just securing our networks. Now that everything is connected, now that all of our global business is online, making sure that everything is really secure. And a lot of the things that actually we've been talking about on this show today, I I thought you and the team did a great job of highlighting what are some of the top threats and how can we protect against those threats? I think that's the second big trend is just security and being very cognizant of the fact that these are open threat vectors that we're all exposed to these days, right? You deploy the wrong IoT device on your network, you deploy the wrong camera on your network, you've now opened up a back door into your network that an attacker can can leapfrog off of and they can get access to all the, all your data and all your devices. So that's the second big thing. And I think the third thing is this merging is what I'll call it of multiple different layers of the network. So I think traditionally you had a security appliance that you would deploy on premise uh, that security appliance would then send that traffic through your data center over a traditional VPN connection, and then that would go out to the internet. Now, what's happened, both as a result of cloud as well as a result of the pandemic that's forced us all to work from our homes, is a complete collapse of that traditional enterprise architecture. And now everybody's working from everywhere, 
right? You and I have our cell phones. I mean, I probably do half my job for my cell phone right here. So we're all roaming around. No one really has a security appliance in their home. So this merging of the this kind of ubiquitous, always on enterprise layer and this and providing security for that layer and then sending all this traffic to the cloud in a very secure way, I think we're seeing this kind of evolving space and it's and some people call it SD-WAN, some people call it security in the cloud. Um, the analysts are starting to call it SASE, the Secure Access Service. Edge. So I think mm -hmm, it's that mm -hmm. collapse of the traditional enterprise routing layer, the traditional enterprise security layer, and the merging of all these things into the SASE layer. Um, and at, a, at, at the highest level, it's about providing users with ubiquitous, secure, always on internet access, even if they're not going through right. a traditional security appliance. So all these things are kind of converging in a really interesting, exciting way. Cisco is doing a lot of cool things. There's a lot of new cool startups that are doing some great things in this space. And uh, I think the market is for the taking for all these new companies. Yeah, it's interesting you talked about trends. You, you talked a lot about some really interesting things in there. I want to kind of dig into a couple of them here. Now, now as organizations tend to move to the SD1 space, you you pointed out a couple of things. One is there's lots of challenges that go along with that. And that is this the fact that an SD1 is is kind of like a network overlay. It's it's a fabric and it it doesn't include things like access control and security. And so you need to do things outside of that in order to protect yourself and and defend uh, your network when it comes to a cloud environment. Now you, you talked about a couple of those things. What do you expect organizations will be start doing to actually fill those gaps for SD1? Yeah, so I think actually you're absolutely right. You know, there's there's a whole wide variety of different types of SD WAN solutions, some more complete than others. And for example, the approach that we're taking here at Cisco is to integrate security and SD WAN. In fact, if you look at Meraki's approach to SD WAN, we started with the security appliance. And we added SD-WAN capabilities into our security appliance so that you can overlay those access security policies so that you can overlay your user policies and whatever type of access rules you want for ubiquitous users, wherever they might be. So I think you're seeing more and more of an integrated security approach. But I do think that, look, if you're moving towards an SD-WAN type of architecture or you're moving towards an architecture where you're trying to provide ubiquitous access to users outside of the traditional enterprise LAN, then I think keeping security in mind, right? Keeping security in mind, evaluating different types of security policies and architectures and vendors and building that into your network access strategy so that as you move into this ubiquitous world and you leverage SD-WAN and you maybe move off of more traditional enterprise paths, you're not suddenly opening up a vector for attack. So I think just keeping security in mind and designing with security in mind and then maybe also evaluating some of these new SD-WAN vendors that include security as a part of their offering. Now, Raj, you've been talking about this a little bit. You've alluded to this previously about the fact that there is the fact that SD WAN is actually merging with security solutions like SASE to to help really combine things in order to make things more secure here. Uh, you know, like for instance, making sure that your uh, you know there's firewall as a service, or maybe there's zero trust network access built in. But what are what are some organizations doing? Are, are some of these vendors kind of combining all of them? Are they are they kind of ad hoc? Are they a la carte? Can you get it's pay for play? How does this all work? And what are organizations doing? And what are vendors doing to make this a little bit more secure? Yeah, so great question, though. I mean, it's an entire spectrum of solutions. So the very traditional way of architecting for security is you have a security appliance at your edge, that security appliance sends all of its traffic to another security appliance in the data center, and then that goes out to wherever it's going. Now, what's happening is uh, more and more of an evolution of this, where in some cases, people are eliminating that security appliance in the data center. So the security traffic can go directly from your edge device out to the cloud. Maybe you have a split tunnel architecture where some application traffic goes out to the cloud. You know, Let's say your consumer applications go out to the cloud, but your sensitive enterprise apps go directly to your data center. Um, or you can eliminate the need for that edge appliance entirely, and you can just use something like a Cisco AnyConnect VPN client on your phone. So what we're trying to solve for at Cisco is all of the above use cases. And you can actually use Cisco products, Meraki products, in some cases, additional Cisco products like AnyConnect, um, the, mm -hmm. the Cisco security appliance portfolio. So it's a very rich set of, of services that we offer so that we can cater to all of the different types of options that I, that I talked about. I think what we're seeing though, is we're seeing more and more of an evolution towards a ubiquitous, always on for, directly from your cell phone type of connected security layer. So Cisco is architecting for that um, because I think that's probably gonna be the end state in five to 10 years. Right, right. 
Now, I do want to talk about one topic, and then I, I do want to bring my co-host back in, and that's just IoT in general, because we talk a lot about IoT on this on this show, and I, I know that you know it, it's kind of forcing enterprises to re-architect, to change the way they handle their lands and their wands. And you know, there's lots of challenges that come along with it. Like, for instance, um, there's lots of resource challenges when it comes like there's inadequate network resources when it comes to IRT just because of the sheer number of them. Um, obviously, security being a big topic. Um, and of course, there's lack of interoperability between the devices. What what are things that have to evolve and support in order to make these things better for IoT? Well, I think just to quickly re recap what you just said, because I, I think you said it really well, there's this huge challenge right now with IoT where more and more devices are coming online, they're coming onto the enterprise network, and in some cases these devices are not secure, in some cases these devices are streaming video, streaming you know video over your networks, and they could, for example, hose your bandwidth if you're not careful. So how does an enterprise architect for this new onslaught of IoT device? And there's going to be something like 50 billion new IoT connected endpoints, I think over the next few years or something something along those lines. I think I've got the order of magnitude right. So I think there's a number of things we can do. Um, first of all, every enterprise networking vendor, some better than others, provide good, robust security tools and built-in features. For example, on the, on the Cisco portfolio side, we offer ways where you can quickly, using drag and drop capabilities in an intuitive UI, architect security policies to handle IoT devices specifically and set up rule-based access control. So for example, if there's a, if there's an unknown device, put it into a special VLAN. If there's a certain type of device, for example, an iPad versus an iPhone versus a known enterprise device, treat it differently. Give it access to a certain set of policies. So there's a really um, rich policy engine that Cisco makes called the Identity Services Engine that provides a lot of these types of capabilities. So I think that's like the status quo. And I think most security, most networking vendors in the industry provide these kinds of built-in access control rules and systems and engines in their products. That's the status quo today. But where I think the industry has to go and a lot of the work that we're doing is trying to become smarter so that we can take more of an automated way and use capabilities like machine learning to treat devices differently, to maybe once a device starts to misbehave or once we see a certain threat vector manifest, quarantine that device, throw up alerts. So I think we're gonna start to move more and more into a world where the network becomes smarter and more of a more of a self-healing or a self-driving type of a network where it can not just not just optimize the network and optimize performance, but it can start to take security actions based off of what might be happening in your environment. So I think because a lot of this stuff is unpredictable, because a lot of these attacks are zero day attacks, because some of these devices you know, are completely unknown devices, even to the network administrator, I think the network has to become smarter. And that's why we at Cisco are investing heavily in, in capabilities like ML and AI so that we can become and provide a smarter approach to solving some of the, some of these sorts of problems. Fantastic. Thank you, Raj. Well, there's a lot more to talk about. Um, we definitely want to get there and I also want to bring my co-host back in. But before we do and before we get to all that goodness, we do have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Nareva. Now, there are plenty of simple plug and play audio solutions for huddle rooms, but getting full room mic coverage in a midsize or even a large meeting room in a learning space has traditionally meant making a big leap into complexity and much higher costs of like pro AV solutions. But Nareva is changing all that by simplifying almost every aspect of audio conferencing. Now let's compare the two approaches to getting quality audio in larger spaces. Now purchase and installation. Think about this, pro AV systems for mid-sized to large rooms involves multiple components, including mics and speakers installed in the ceiling or spread across the table and lots and lots of cables, tons of cables. Now needs specialized technicians to determine the required components, install and then calibrate the systems effectively. Now it takes days for installation sometimes. Now costs in the, could be in the tens of thousands of dollars per room for purchase and installation. Now let's talk about Nareva Audio. Now it provides exceptional audio for a room up to 25 by 25 feet with one integrated microphone and speaker bar. Now the two bars cover a space up to 30 by 50 feet and 
installs is as simple as a DIY project. That's right. It takes about 30 minutes to install each device on the wall with two screws and one cable, and it costs a fraction, a fraction of Pro AV systems. Now let's talk about mic coverage. Now for Pro AV systems, typically that means using a beam forming mic system that that may provide you know good pickup within the beams, but there can be diminished pickup if a talker moves outside or faces away from those beams, and it needs to be recalibrated if you rearrange the room. Now, with Noreva's microphone mist technology, you get true full room coverage. So everyone has is heard no matter where they are in the room and where they move or even where they face, which is great. And a continuous auto calibration means your room is always ready. That's right. Now, one last thing, management software. Now, Pro AV systems, managing Pro AV systems can be really, really complicated. In fact, training actually may be required for IT pros just to operate the software. Nareva console is simple, intuitive platform that lets you easily monitor, manage, adjust, and scale your fleet of systems from anywhere. No training required. The question is, which approach will you choose? Learn more at nareva.com slash twit. That's N-U-R-E-V-A dot com slash twit. And we thank Noreva for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, we've been talking with Raj Krishna. He's the VP of strategy and planning at Cisco Meraki. Lots to talk about here about software defined networking, lots of different topics going on here. But we do want to bring my co-host back in because they want to talk about some interesting topics that uh, they have found in the industry. I want to start with Curtis. Curtis. Thanks very much. Well, one of the things that I want to talk about has to do with all of these remote workers and and the very broadly distributed edge that we're all dealing with right now. I noticed that one of the things that Meraki is uh, including as part of its uh, infrastructure kit is the VPN. And I'm curious about this because you have a lot of companies that are now advertising access methods that they say are um, beyond the VPN or VPN less. Do you think that VPNs are still a valuable part of a remote access toolkit or is it something that's just a historical legacy and we're really in the process of moving past them? So Curtis, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I think it depends on what you mean by VPN, because some, you're right, some vendors are saying, look, VPN is dead, VPN is a thing of the past. Um, But if you look at what they're doing, what some of these vendors are doing, they have a VPN-like tunnel, right? So I think tunneling, if you want to call it in a more general way, at the end of the day, even if you eliminate the need for a hardware appliance at the edge and all you have is is a cell phone and that cell phone is sending traffic, if you want to filter that traffic, then you need to establish a tunnel from that device to wherever it's going. So even if that tunnel is not using a traditional VPN technology, that tunnel is hopefully an encrypted tunnel and it's sending traffic somewhere that's being filtered. So I think VPN maybe is a slightly um, antiquated term and whatever you want to call this new term, sassy, or you want to call it filtering, or you want to call it the new edge architecture. But I think the need to basically take traffic and filter it, I think will always be there, right? Because we want our traffic to be secure and we want our users to be able to access their networks from wherever they are. So uh, again, here at Cisco, there's a number of different capabilities that we provide. Everything from a hardware appliance, you know, for the campus, for the branch, we also make a little, a nice little sleek, very cheap device called our Z3 device. And that's built specifically for people's homes. It's a teleworker device. And that, again, is, is a piece of hardware VPN technology that'll create an encrypted tunnel. So if you want to have that hardware device, you can have it. If you want to have an AnyConnect software client on your phone, and that'll create a software VPN tunnel back to wherever you want to send it, either to a security appliance that Cisco has or third-party security appliance or directly to the cloud, that's possible also. So, you know, it's it's kind of a matter of terminology, but I think to answer your question at a high level, the need for a a VPN style of a service, I think will always be there. But the way that it is being delivered, the encryption methods are changing, the style is changing, the need for hardware is changing, but that need to provide a filtering service for the enterprise traffic will always be there. 
Okay, and when you were talking about that, you mentioned uh, a small device that you would make available that uh, is intended for home users. Now, home users have been in the minds of people in IT over the last, say, 20 months, much more than they were in the past. And one of my questions, you know, there are many companies out there that are now looking at having to take the extraordinary step of even managing their uh, employees' home networks in order to ensure security. You mentioned the the edge device that, that you have available. Do you think that that is something that could be deployed as an alternative to try to and fully manage the employee's home network? Absolutely. In fact, right now, uh, we saw, we actually looked at the data when the pandemic hit and we saw a massive spike in two things. The first spike that we saw was a usage of our client VPN technology. So what is that technology? It's the ability to use either the built-in VPN software that comes bundled with iOS and Android, or you can deploy a client VPN agent that Cisco makes and using that client VPN software to connect back to a centralized security appliance. So we saw a massive spike in users. And in fact, what we did was you saw not only a massive spike in users, but we saw a massive spike in support cases that were related to people trying to configure this capability. So we went in and we reoriented the way that that page was designed. It was a really cool uh, cross UX PM engineering exercise that we ran through and we saw the support load drop. So that was the first spike that we saw. And then the second spike that we saw was a huge surge in demand for exactly the device that you're talking about, which is this um, cute little teleworker device that we make. It's called the Meraki Z3. In fact, it sold out uh, once the pandemic hit and we had to make a, a whole heck of a lot more of them. And it's this nice little VPN box that also has integrated wireless. Um, and it also has some integrated switch ports as well. So this nice little device, it's very affordable. And we saw customers, you know, that had, let's say, a thousand remote users or 10,000 remote users. They would buy 10,000 of them. And then they would ship one to every site. And the beauty of a cloud managed architecture like Meraki is you can push out a policy, you can push out a config change, it goes to all these sites and you can set up all your VPN tunnels with just a couple of clicks. So um, we saw a massive surge in demand for this Teleworker Z3 device. It is just one of the many ways that you can manage your workers remotely effectively at scale. Another example for you is if you, let's say you don't wanna deploy hardware in every single person's home because it can be expensive or it can be, uh, it can take some time, although with Meraki, it's, it's much, much easier than uh, the other vendors in the industry. But let's say you don't want to do that. Another option is you can deploy a soft agent to the endpoint. Now, you may ask, okay, but how do I really do this at scale? How do I do this at 10,000 devices or 100,000 devices at scale? Deploy an agent to these devices and manage the agent. If the agent gets wiped, I want to make sure that I also change the way that the that, that uh, device's access policies get configured. So we also have a solution called the Meraki MDM Agent Systems Manager. Now there's a number of different MDM, also known as EMM, Enterprise Mobility Management softwares in the market, you know, Mobile Iron, AirWatch, uh, all, you know, the likes of all these um, endpoint management software. So we, we at Cisco have one called the Meraki Systems Manager, but there's other endpoint agent management agents out in the market too. So you can use these endpoint managers to manage all your assets at scale. So there's a number of different ways of doing this. And there's, and it's actually a little bit fragmented right now in the industry. And that's why I think there's a lot of opportunity for vendors like Cisco, established vendors like Cisco, as well as new startups to come in and try to own this space and try to define what is the best in class way to provide access to, to remote users in this new remote distributed world. Hubert. So I, I've been around, I've been knocking around a while. And one of the things that I heard a similar message about securing the endpoint, securing all the connections within the enterprise uh, was a huge push called 802.1x port authentication. Um, was that a building block for what you folks are doing? Or is SASE just a lot further down the line? Because 802.1x supplicants are available in just about every modern operating system. Yeah, so 802.1x I would say is one of the fundamental building blocks of user authentication, right? Authenticating a user's credentials, making sure that this person is who they say that they are. But I think it is just one of the many tools. If you want to really do packet by packet inspection, you want to make sure that you're catching malware, spyware, ransomware, that you're catching injected iframes or whatever, whatever uh, number of threat vectors that exist, 
then 802.1x is not sufficient on its own, right? You need the ability to actually inspect packet by packet. And that's where I think 802.1x, it is a very, it's a, it's a built-in feature, for example, in our wireless, in our switching portfolio. And it is very much like one of, I would say, the table stakes things that IT vendors, uh, IT administrators should look at, but it's not the only thing, right? And, and, and I think it, it all depends on like how sensitive are your applications, um, what type of access are you trying to provide to users when they're remotely out in the field, and then supplementing things like 802.1x with additional capability. I mean, I'll, I'll give you another example, right? Um, WPA3, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relatively new encryption standard on, on Wi-Fi networks. It basically raises the bar for how heavily you're encrypting something and how difficult it becomes to decrypt something. Now, WPA3 on its own, Sure, you know, if you just use it on its own and you're connecting to a to a local LAN network, it's probably pretty good, but do you want to supplement that if that user is now connect if that device is connecting beyond the LAN to a sensitive application in the cloud and they're sending sensitive traffic, right? Because that link that is being sent or that data that's being sent over that link may be an unencrypted link beyond just the LAN. Right. So depending on the type of application and where the traffic is going and who the user is, I think there's a number of different tools. 802.1x is one of them. WPA3 is one of them. But it, it kind of depends on how end to end of, a, of an approach do you need and how sensitive is the application and the user that, that, that you're trying to secure. Great question. Great, great, great question. So I do want to jump quite slightly into a, a different topic really quick because we're running a little bit low on time. Now, Cisco has slightly shifted their strategy over the last couple of years. Um, we've seen a greater spend actually on Meraki products and services uh, than any other area. We've seen actually quite a bit of increase there. What what message is this sending that Cisco sending here? Well, it's just that the cloud is the future, right? I mean, if you look at if you look at deploying, look, the need for deploying wireless routing, now known as SD WAN, which is just a fancy way of saying routing, right? Um, s switching endpoints, like the needs to deploy these capabilities and architectures is not going down, right? In fact, we're more and more reliant on networking, we're more and more reliant on communicating. I mean, e even if you think about non-enterprise uses, right? We watch all of our movies online. We communicate with all of our relatives online. Heck, the only reason why we've stayed sane, I stayed sane during the pandemic is because I'm able to communicate with my parents over a weekly Zoom call that we have. So the need for networking is not going down, but the way that you can deliver networking architectures at scale and the way that you can manage those architectures in a secure and intelligent way and getting more analytics so that you understand how are people using your networks and creating turnkey tools so that people can quickly and effectively architect policies that say, okay, I want to block Netflix traffic on my corporate network between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Just as one very simple example, I mean, there's like a thousand examples like that, right, of, t of different types of policies and, and empowering IT administrators to be able to set up these types of rules and scale these rules and do this at a very large scale. That is the beauty of a product like Meraki, right? It's taking that traditional way of architecting networks and it's supercharging it. Because what we're doing is we're taking as much of the management complexity, which was traditionally in appliances, which was traditionally in CLI, which was traditionally in a very complex set of steps you have to take, and we're putting it all in the cloud and we're painting it with a very nice, intuitive, easy to use user interface. And that user interface will save you time, it'll save you money, and it'll let you build the most powerful networks possible to achieve the use cases that we're talking about. So I think if you think about just cloud and what it is and the types of benefits that it can drive, it can allow you to architect the most powerful networks out there in the easiest way possible. And this is why Meraki is uh, continuing to be a business that's on fire. It's continuing to grow very, very quickly. It's one of the fastest growing parts, um, not just of Cisco, but just in the market in general, if you think about the networking market in general. So I think it's because um, of the fundamental fact that you can architect networks and you can do it in a secure, quick, easy, seamless, and fun way um, for cheaper, right? And, and, and who wouldn't want that? Well, thank you, Raj. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. Thank you so much for being here. Really do appreciate it. But we do want to give you a chance to tell the folks at home where they can find out more about Cisco Meraki and maybe how they can get started, how they can get, how they can get involved and learn about more. Yeah, definitely. So if you go to Meraki.com, M-E-R-A-K-I.com, um, a lot of information about our products is available. We have the easiest 
to use free trial program in the industry. So if you want to try out one of our wireless access points, you want to try out one of our switches, just try it. You know, it's a it's a no obligation, no commitment trial and just try the product for yourself. So, you know, sometimes people come to me and they ask, well, you know, you're saying a lot of cool, fancy things and, you know, cool, you know, power to you, but how can I really trust you? And I say, don't trust me, actually, because every vendor now is talking about AI, ML, cloud. They're all using buzzwords. They're all foaming at the mouth. What I say is, look, just try the products for yourself and try them. If you want to try Meraki alongside some of our competitors, please do. And try them if you're an enterprise and a multi-site POC, proof of concept. And that's where you will see the product shine. That's where you'll see the cloud shine, the UI UX shine. So uh, meraki.com is where you can learn more. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Raj. Well, folks, you've done it again. You sat through another hour of the Best Thing Enterprise podcast in the universe. So definitely tune your podcatcher to Twyat. I do want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-hosts. I want to start with our very own Mr. Brian Chi Chibert. What's going on for you in the coming weeks and where can people find you? I am actually getting ready to uh, start doing planning, you know, big push for planning for Maker Faire Orlando. And that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm out. And Burke has been talking to me in the background about a really cool uh, portable case that he built for Leo that holds an ATEM mini uh, video mixer in it. So I might build one if I can afford it. Hmm. Must have toys. But anyway, uh, we've been getting some great feedback. And for one user, uh, she has sent me tilting at windmills about some FCC policies that I'm going to try and dig and see if I can go and um, maybe, just maybe, get someone from the FCC to talk to us a bit. Anyway, you can hit me. I'm on Twitter at ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab. Or you're welcome to drop me an email. I'm Chebert, spelled C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T at twit.tv. Or if you'd like to um, throw a comment at all the Twit hosts, uh, Twiet hosts, send it to Twiet at twit.tv and uh, we'll love to hear from you. And it doesn't matter if you're going to do it in a, you know your native language, just make sure you put some note in there what language it is so we can try to use it. Um, translator, and we'll try and get you a nice response back as soon as possible. Love to hear from you folks. Thanks, Chibert. Well, we also have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. That's right. He's uh, he's a busy guy. So we want to learn a little bit more what's going on for you in the coming weeks, Curtis, as well as where can people find you and all your work? Well, I'm digging deep into some of my research topics, including the uh, awareness training for cybersecurity and beginning to do some looking at risk monitoring and risk assessment. So plenty to look at, uh, trying to publish a bit more on LinkedIn. I've got some things up on the Omdia site. So please follow my Twitter, KG4GWA. Follow me on LinkedIn. And uh, would love to hear your ideas for what you think is important, what you'd like to see more of, and uh, just in general, where you think analysts should spend more of their time in the great world of cybersecurity. Thank you, Curtis. Well, folks, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to get your enterprise and IT news. And we want to help you and make it easy for you to listen and catch up on your enterprise and IT news. Now go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all the amazing back episodes, the show notes, the co-host information, the guest information, of course, the stories that we do during the show. But more importantly, next to those videos, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting your audio version, your video version of your choice. Listen on any one of your devices or any one of your podcast applications because we're on all of them. So definitely support the show and subscribe. Plus, you may have also heard that's right, Club Twit. It's a members only ad free podcast service with a bonus Twit Plus feed that you can't get anywhere else. Some great content on there. I saw a really great interview with Steve Gibson on there recently. It's only seven dollars per month and one of my favorite things as well as that twit plus feed is also the exclusive access to the members only discord channel we have some great characters in there some great discussions some after hours discussions really fun and interesting topics in there so definitely check that out and be part of a join club twit and be part of the movement go to twit.tv slash 
Club Twit. Now, Club Twit now offers corporate group plans as well. That's right. It's a great way to give your team access to our ad free tech podcast. Plans start with five members at a discounted rate of $6 each per month, and you can add as many seats as you like. Now, this is a great way for your IT department or your developers or tech teams to stay up to date with access to all of our podcasts. And it's just like a regular membership. They can also join the Twit Discord server and get that Twit Plus bonus feed as well. So sign up as well at twit.tv slash club twit. Of course, we have one more option as well. That's right, the a la carte option. And Twit has actually partnered with Apple Podcasts to make it so you can pick those individual shows for ad-free viewing. You, single show subscriptions with Apple Podcasts are only $2.99 per month per show. So lots of options for you. Definitely check out Club Twit as well as the a la carte ad free pop option for single shows. Now, after you subscribe, impress your friends, your family members, your coworkers with the gift of Twy, because we talk a lot of about fun tech topics on the show, and I guarantee they will find it fun and interesting as well. So definitely share it with them, get them to subscribe. Now, after you've subscribed, and if you're available Friday, right now, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time, we do this show live. That's right, twit.tv slash live. We Come see the, how the pizza's made. Come see the behind the scenes, all the fun stuff that we do, all the banter we do during here, during the show and after the show here on Twitch. So definitely check that out and be part of the live stream. Now, if you're going to be part of the live stream, we also have our infamous IRC channel as well. That's irc.twit.tv. We have some great characters in there. Some amazing questions come out of their discussions. I, I sometimes laugh during the show on mute uh, because of some of the stuff that happens in there. So definitely join our IRC channel as well. It's a really great place. Uh, to gain feedback as well. So definitely check that out and be part of that as well. Now, definitely hit me up on twitter.com slash LuMM. I post all my enterprise tidbits there, but also I like to get direct messages from people like you, get some show ideas, have some good conversations, and really just talk tech. So, so check that out. I posted a little bit about how I needed some caffeine today because today was one of those days, but TGIF for sure. Of course, you know, also, if you want to learn a little bit more what I do on Microsoft or my normal work week, you can always check out developers.microsoft.com slash office. There we post all the latest and greatest ways you can customize your office solutions to make it more productive for you and your organization. Definitely check out Office Script. It's the latest and greatest ways you can change your Excel spreadsheets and actually create automated macros and automated scripts online for your organization, be able to share it with everybody and actually uh, customize those solutions. So really check out Office Script. It's a really cool, cool feature that we've just built. Um, I, I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible because we really couldn't do this show without them, especially thank you to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support us each and every week and we couldn't do this show without them. So thank you for all their support over the years. I also want to thank all the engineers and the staff at Twit. They're what makes this show possible. I also want to thank one more time, Mr. Brian Chi, because he's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer as well. He's dual, 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 uh, dual uh, jobs here. He, he does all the bookings and the plannings for the show, and we really couldn't do it without him. So thank you, Chiever, for all your support. And of course, so before we sign out, I do want to thank our editor, Mr. Victor B. He makes us look good after the facts. So thank you, Victor. As well as our TD for today, Mr. Ant Pruitt. He's a very talented guy and he has a fabulous show called Hands On Photography. And what's going on for you this week and what's what's going on in Hands On Photography? Well, Mr. Lou, uh, pretty big week. This was episode 100 of Hands On Photography and I was able to sit down with Seth Miranda, an amazing special effects photographer and we right. just just sat down and chat. It was a lot of fun and, and pretty loose and just a great conversation. But I also recorded some bonus stuff. So if you're a Club Twit member, we got a nice uh -huh. bit of a horror story, a photography horror story in our uh, Club Twit feed that's going out here. Actually, it's already out now. So go check that out too. Good stuff. People love to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly. So that sounds good to me. Thank you, Ann. Well, I, until next time, I'm Louis Maresca. Just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Hey, you don't have to wait to the weekend to get the tech news you need. Join Jason Howell and myself, Micah Sargent, for Tech News Weekly, where we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. Okay.